Cool. So my name is Anya. I am the games outreach lead at Kickstarter. Um, I've been with Kickstarter almost two years. Um, I have a very weird history in games. I've been in games almost 10 years. Um, I used to run developer relations for a little flash gaming site called addictinggames.com. So if you ever made a flash game, I have probably chatted with you. Um, so I'm going to do just a quick couple notes on Kickstarter. Um, I just have to ask, I guess, who here does not know what Kickstarter is? Awesome. This is going to make my job much easier. Um, and then I'm going to introduce our four wonderful panelists. We're very excited to chat with everybody today. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, things about uh, setbacks in game design and, and sort of that creative challenge and process. So what is Kickstarter? Kickstarter is the largest creative funding platform. Um, our mission is to bring creative projects to life. We have 15 categories, games being one of the largest, but we also have categories like dance, theater, music, design and technology. Um, basically, if there's a creative endeavor and you need funding, you can come to us. Does anybody know what this little guy is from? Yeah? Go ahead and tell me. Good job. <laughs> Um, our numbers are sort of always changing. They're always increasing, which is exciting. Um, so as of today, we have $3.2 billion pledged on the site. Um, we are eight years old. We'll be celebrating our ninth anniversary next year in 2018. Um, we are available to creators in 22 countries, most recently Mexico and Japan, which is very exciting. Um, so being available in 22 countries, that also means 131 thousand, I'm not great with numbers, um, have, projects have been su su successfully funded, uh, which is really fantastic. So that means 100, over 131,000 projects, including games, um, have now been brought into the world because of backers and creators like you. Um, we are also a PBC, which means Public Benefit Corporation. We are a for-profit company obligated to consider the impact of our decisions on society, not just our shareholders. And we do that by do donating 5% of our after-tax profits towards organizations fighting to end systemic inequality. That usually ends up being music and arts uh, education nonprofits, which is really cool. So it definitely makes coming to work pretty easy. Uh, so games specifically, right? Like we're here to talk about games. Um, over 11, oh God, I have numbers. 11,700, is that right? That sounds right? Cool. <laughs> Uh, over that number <laughs> of projects have been successfully funded on games, which equates roughly $700 million pledged to the games category. That's $700 million in almost nine years. Very cool. Um, does anybody know the background of this game? I just realized you can see what it is on the bottom corner. It's Thimbleweed Park. Uh, <laughs> Other projects have included Hyperlight Drifter, Night in the Woods, Super Hot, We Happy Few, Darkest Dungeon, Rain World, and of course, the Moweed Park. And four fabulous games that you are going to hear about very, very soon. Uh, so our first panelist is Bryce. How do you pronounce your last name? Co. Co. Cool. Should have learned that before. Super didn't. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> Bryce funded uh, Aegis Defenders in September of 2014, um, $145,815 pledged and funded, which is exciting. Um, thank you, Bryce, for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, next up, we have Colin Horgan. I just like don't learn people's last names. I don't. I don't know why. I probably should start doing that. Okay, cool. Maybe it's the Californian in me. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Collins project funded earlier this year in July of 2017. It was very fun, very exciting. Um, next up, these two are flipped and that's totally chill. This is Rich from uh, Hyperkinetic Studios. Rich funded Hi Epic Tavern in June of 2016. And lastly, we have Tabby. Um, Tabby funded Quench, which is a super beautiful looking game, I have to say. Um, Quench was funded in May of 2016. So thank you again for being here. I really appreciate it. It's going to be either very awkward or very fun. Hopefully both, if I'm going to be <laughs> honest. Um, so in sort of this discussion that uh, the five of us have kind of been going back and forth on a handful of emails, um, we've been talking about you know setbacks and just like some of the self-doubts that come along with uh, game design and just the creative process in general. And one of the things that I just kind of wanted to open this panel with was milestones, because I feel like milestones are sort of this word that gets tossed around in games, but they aren't really discussed necessarily of like, what is a milestone and how do you define your milestones? Because each studio kind of like does their own 
different thing with a milestone. And if you work with a publisher, there's a whole separate discussion about that. So I'd like to start with Bryce. Um, what, how do you define your milestones? Um, and what do you consider to be a met milestone? Uh, so for us, our game is like level-based. So it's, it's fairly straightforward mm -hmm. in terms of like, we want to deliver this many levels by this date. You know, so it's not too exciting of an answer, but mm -hmm. it's <laughs> basically it. Colin? Uh, so some things I should sh set up, I guess, about my project <laughs> is that um, I it, it's mostly a solo project with just me. So as far as the production stuff goes, it's generally a bit messier and less written down because I'm the only one I need to talk to, really. Um, so my milestones have been kind of weird and only really solidified once the project became like serious uh, official like mm. this is going to be a commercial project and part of that was like the move towards kickstarter so like my first real milestone was like i'm gonna get a kickstarter going <laughs> kind of you know like that was my that was my alpha right um and then once that was done it's like all right now uh, i just need to finish the rest of the game and i'll consider that beta and i've been doing that on a kind of like what bryce was saying a like I, I have a set plan of how much i want to have and like what specific beats i'm hitting in the game and you know hopefully hitting that date and then uh once that's done, polish and release, and that's that gold milestone. <laughs> cool. Tabby? Uh, so I guess to give us background, or give some background on our game, we were actually um, also funded by a, a grant in Ontario, Canada before we came to Kickstarter. So we had milestones set up with like our granting agency um, to make sure that like we were hitting deadlines with them. So that happened even before we kind of started with Kickstarter and we wrapped up with them uh, this spring actually. So our milestones, we also have a like a level-based game. So in terms of what I'm giving to backers and updates, it's usually like groups of levels. Like I'll say, oh, I've done like this region now and um, and send out like a little update with you know some screenshots and that sort of thing. Uh, internally, we were dealing with like sort of having an alpha build for the for the grant and then now we're building out content. So it's, it's just a matter of like, every now and then, like bundling these little content updates. Cool. Rich? Um, How's this thing work? Oh, boy. OK. Uh, OK, so the bullshitty answer is it's a very fluid situation for us <laughs> at Hyperkinetic Studios. Um, we, have a, we have very fluid definitions of beta and alpha, as Tomo likes to put it. Actually, Tomo will kick you in the face if you say something like that. He hates the word beta and alpha. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be straight with you. It's about money. Um, we have a bunch of people that we have to support. Uh, we push that money as far as we possibly can. Uh, for those of you who play RTSs, it's kind of like that. You don't want to have any extra money left over at the end of the day. You want to be squeezing as much value as you can out of that money. Um, and when it gets down to the point where it looks like we're not gonna be able to pay people, we got to find some way to get some money. And so then a milestone appears, <laughs> and you have to hit that, <laughs> or else you die. <laughs> um, Rich, I'm actually going to ask you a follow-up question, and if anybody else would like to answer, that's totally fine, too. Um, so if you don't meet your milestone, like if you, let's say that you do have, you know, 20,000 extra dollars left over, what, uh, what happens? Uh, what, uh, what happens yeah. if you don't meet your milestones? So if we don't meet our milestones, we shut down because we don't make enough money. Right, so is the milestones are really like okay? We need to release at this point because if we don't release at this point, we're not going to have any money, <laughs> <laughs> and then we die unless we can find some other external work or you know contract to support us. So there's never really a case where we get to a point where we've 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 achieved some kind of goal and we have extra money. But I guess theoretically, if we did, um, what we would do is we would dump all that money into uh, advertising, probably, um, or trying to maybe. Like, for instance, uh, get some extra art, you mm -hmm. know, polish into the game. We hire a contractor to come in and do some stuff. Cool. So. I would say for us, um, just speaking to the idea that, like, milestones and paying people are kind of <laughs> connected. Um, yeah, we, <laughs> we do get to points. OK, when we asked for funds on Kickstarter, that mm -hmm. was a pretty small in the scheme of things, a small part of our total budget. Um, and so we do get into phases where we need to either do client work or seek 
like other grants or other kinds of funding in order to like continue production. So we do have like resource backlogs where we have to gather a little bit and then spend and then gather and then spend. And so it tends to be that our milestones are also kind of related to like meeting those kinds of deadlines. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Colin or Bryce? Yeah. You don't have to answer if you don't well, want to. I think um, I should add like in, in a bit of a different scenario because I'm currently not like tied to any other party for mm -hmm. like delivering anything. So generally what happens is I, I try to set a specific goal like, you know, I'm gonna release a new demo for my backers by the end of September or something like that. And then uh, you like see how the progress is going up to that point. And if you find that you're just not gonna hit it or something, uh, like you gotta adapt probably because mm -hmm. there's not really, like you, you can only push yourself back so often. And sometimes maybe just if you're not hitting your goals, it means your goals are maybe a bit too lofty. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that like figuring out the correct scope, even if it's on the fly, which is maybe not the greatest scenario because generally you want to have that stuff planned, but uh, you got to be able to have that flexibility. Otherwise, you you know you might just come to a halt and die, <laughs> like you said. This is a dark panel. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's gonna get a lot darker. I think. <laughs> Um, but yeah, picking back off of what Colin was saying, you know, when you don't hit your milestone and I mean, you basically just have to reevaluate whether your future milestones are going to be doable at all, right? So uh, in terms of Aegis Defenders, we probably cut our game's scope in half at least twice. Mm -hmm. and, and seriously, I mean, that's not like a, oh, let's just do like half the work. It's more like we have to reevaluate the story, mm -hmm. what mechanics are going to be used, and that's, you know, not a smart thing to do, it's not something you want to do, but it's something that like, you know, when you're experimenting with maybe new types of gameplay or genre mixes, that's that's something that happens when experiments don't work out, you know, so. Cool. I think it also kind of points to the divide on like what game development is like when you're just like doing it as like a hobby or a side job versus, because I think like all of us here are like kind of doing the independent thing professionally now, um, as part of the journey from like Kickstarter and getting funding and all that. Um, and those are the kind of things you need to take into consideration where it's like, you can't keep doing it once the money comes out. Like that becomes a factor. Um, and it, it does have an effect on your development and what your game ends up becoming. You know, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, but you just gotta manage it. It's just one of the skills you have to learn yeah. when you start doing this. Cool. Um, I think that's a good segue into setbacks and self-doubt. I think everybody has experienced this. Um, it, whether in game design or just personal life or anything like that, but I think in game design too, like it's just it's so prevalent in the creative process. Um, so I'm gonna pose this to anybody that would. <laughs> That's Colin's game. game. Sorry. It's Colin's game. Uh, all right. Well then, Colin, I'm gonna pick on you. Uh, cool. So where did you feel like things were going off the rails, and how did you manage that? So it's kind of funny. Uh, the game is like consistently one of the best parts of my life right now. <laughs> Okay. or at least how it's going. Um, but um, I run into issues, n not so much with developing of the game, but um, like one, one big problem I've had is in, I guess, marketing or publicizing it, especially because you know, I'm making this game called Luca, and it has a, what I'm told, a pretty unique art style that uh, not a lot of people get immediately <laughs> um, and I've gotten a lot of pushback and a lot of mean internet comments and stuff like that that mm -hmm. has like put real dampers on my mood sometimes you know and like you know, I can get kind of depressed from seeing the comments and stuff but um, like a, a few things kind of drive me through that you know one is like I have faith in what I'm making like I think it's good and I enjoy it um, also you know I've, I've accrued a bit of an audience and like this can be a double-edged sword but I, I find you know having people who can see and receive your work, even if sometimes it's like negative stuff, you gotta remember there's a lot of people who love what you're doing and that's why they're following what you're doing and choosing to comment on it and you, you gotta hold that dear too. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I had a last thing, but I forgot it for now so other people can <laughs> comment. Cool. Uh, Rich, I'm gonna throw it to you. Um, we exist in kind of like this flow state of self-doubt all the time. <laughs> um, and I think that if you're not doubting yourself a little bit, then maybe you're not, uh, maybe you're not doing your job, right? You know, when we're working on Epic Tavern, we kind of integrate that into the whole process. Um, we really wanted to get to the point where we got 
the game out in front of people and in people's hands as quickly as possible so we could start getting, um, you know, start getting people's feedback and integrate that in, right? Our games are very complicated, like, like you're managing, you're getting a bunch of heroes drunk and putting them on your roster and sending them out on adventures. And we have a whole bunch of uh, features that aren't done yet. And so we decided instead of hiding those features to put them out there and put a construction sign on it and put a mouse over that explains what it's gonna be later on. Um, so people come in and they're raging. They're like, why are all these under construction signs there? Ah, right? And what you do is you go, oh, okay, okay, okay. So what do you think about this though? Like, what is it? What is it? What is it makes you so angry about this? Um, and, you know, and you find find nice ways to put that. And they go, well, well, it's just, I, it's just I really want that. And I go, oh, okay. So tell me what your ideas are for that. Like, how do you picture that in your head? And they're like, well, you know, I, I think it's going to be this. And like, I'm just frustrated because I'm not. It's not there. And I'm like, yeah, I'm frustrated too. I'm very frustrated that it's not working. And, and what I want you to do is help me to, to define that feature better so that we can get it into your hands quicker. And then all of a sudden they're working for us, kind of, right? Mm. Um, and it's, it's awesome. Like it's, it's, a, it's a good way to kind of turn that around. But you know, we have a lot of doubt about these things. And, and you know, being able to take kind of that, that fear and anger that gets directed towards those things and turn it into this positive force that works for us and helps us to either confirm or you know, debunk whatever our theories are mm -hmm. is, is kind of the way that you know, we, we like to proceed. It, it sort of sounds like rather than fighting with the community, you're sort of inviting them in and allowing them to yeah. give them a voice rather than fight with that voice. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Tabby. Yeah, speaking of self-doubt and, and what you're talking about, um, our game, I mean, we've definitely been working on it a lot longer than I wanted to, and <laughs> I think I'm definitely my worst critic. Like, if anybody is thinking about why isn't my game done and why aren't any of these features in it yet, it's me. Like, I'm the one, you know, being really hard on myself. And what we found is that um, our community of backers is like universally supportive of us <laughs> and of what we're doing. And and coming to events like this and and showing our game off to um, people who are seeing it for the first time, their enthusiasm for it is always surprising to me. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm so like close to it that I can't see it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I really find that actually the community um, is a really good source of emotional support for me when, as I'm trying to finish this this huge project that has taken over my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Bryce. Yeah, I I agree. I'm kind of in the same boat where you know we just came back from showing the game off at several different conventions, mm -hmm. and that's always the the huge lift in my morale. But most of the time. I'm really down on <laughs> like what where the project's at. I'm like, it, not not that it's like qualitatively bad, but I feel like my main struggle is always that there's not enough time. You know, it's always just like it would be great if we had another week to do this or another month or whatever. You know, it might be. Um, so, you know, the, the the constant like struggle is that we can deliver on this only so much before we're just going to be out of money and, and dead. So uh, the only way that I can pull myself out of those sort of self-doubts is by just like trying to get in as much of a flow state with working. You know, it's like literally just yeah. like, how do I become more efficient? How do we do this faster? And that's what I'm going to think about when I go to bed instead of like, oh, God, everything sucks. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is real interesting for me to hear, too, because I think I'm like, the relative like youngest or least along in my project as far as everyone else on the group uh and you know we kickstarted four months ago now i think three months ago yeah and numbers so and, and that was like when like full-time development kind of like really started for me mm -hmm. so and you, you all have been doing it for like you know at least a year or two so it's interesting to hear i, I hope i don't have to run into these kind of things but i guess i will <laughs> Well, I think what's really interesting from what I'm hearing is that uh, there's two ways to get involved in your community, right? So like if you take Rich's approach, you really engage with your community. You ask questions. You say like, okay, cool, you're upset. Let's talk about this. And I think from Bryce's perspective, like it's and, and you get a lot of value out of that. And I think, Bryce, what you're saying is being able to go to these events and show the game off and see sort of that like immediate gratification from backers, fans, people within the community. Like that's, there's something really valuable about that. So I think I think that's... Fantastic advice. Um, I'm sort of curious. I actually don't know if this has happened to anybody on the panel, and like 
totally chill if not. Has anybody run into post-funding issues once your Kickstarter has completed? So, like, you ran out of money. Yeah. <laughs> Those microphones went up real fast. All right. So, uh, so, so uh, who, who here is a, a professional game dev, like, worked in a big company worked in like kind of a smaller company. All right, so those of you who know, a lot of people use, and they've been using this for like 10 years. I don't know why they still use it. It costs about $10,000 a month per person um, to run a game studio, right? I mean, just rule of thumb type of thing. Um, for us, that is much, much cheaper. Our burn rate is about, uh, when we were at our full size, it was like what, like $50,000 a month? Okay. Wow. $68,000, I think, is what we made on the Kickstarter. I mean, numbers, again, uh, yeah. it's somewhere here. <laughs> we, we've been going <laughs> for like right. two years. We've been going for two years. We need to pull in a bunch more money. Like, that That was just, it's not a, you know, it's not a small thing that, you know, it's not a, a thing that we can do with like one or two people that can just keep going forever. It would take like eight years to make this game. It's not going to happen. So, yeah, we ran into a lot of issues. And, and contracting, uh, outside investment, um, getting to early access as soon as we possibly could were all things that we did to mitigate that. Cool. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I don't work with a huge team. It's the, the Quench team is uh, a core of about five people and with contractors that maybe goes up to like 12. So, I mean, it's bigger than like a solo project for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a lot of expenses as well. And like I said, we had some outside funding. But the thing is that the Kickstarter... We asked for what we knew we could get, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of research to try and nail down that number and figure out what we could get given our audience size, you know, given what we were making. And it's definitely not th the number that we need to make the project. Um, so yeah, we run into funding issues all the time. And the thing is that what that creates is a situation where I have to spend part of my time thinking about where to get sources of funding. So mm -hmm. whether that's doing client work, which takes my time away from the game, or whether it's um, coming to events like this, which might raise morale, but again, it's an expense and it takes my time away from the game, or whether it's, um, you know, like thinking about marketing or, or doing grant applications or doing um, like pitches to publishers. Mm -hmm. All of that takes my time away from the game. And it is itself also working on the game, but it's not like content work, right? Right. And so... Um, it's kind of a balancing act between scheduling and budgeting, and budgeting kind of has to win, because otherwise we die. <laughs> so that's why it's delayed, ultimately. Yeah, 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 yeah. cool. Uh, I think it's important you brought this up, because I know, you know, this is something I had to learn when I was transitioned from like just being like a game student to like a professional, but um, it feels like there's a, a wide misconception among you know like mostly like people who play games that you know games that go on Kickstarter like the Kickstarter funds is not the only source of income that that game probably needs to get done. You know, there's like people have jobs and contracting work, all the stuff that you all were talking about that also goes into it. And I think that's true for like everyone on here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and I mean. So hearing that number, like um, how much your burn down rate was per month, like I think like it kind of just speaks to our team's inexperience with working on a, a game that we try to do it on like almost nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Basically people are, are working on like a salary so low, it's just gonna barely cover their, their cost of living. And we have been trying to do something that's way too large a scope to maintain that. So the lessons I've learned from making this game are that, um, you know, obviously you can't make it off of just uh, whatever your Kickstarter ask is. Um, like, if anything, that amount of money that you, you make almost can only stand in for, like, marketing or, <laughs> or just, just, like, think of the event itself as a marketing thing because the amount of outside funding you're going to need to find or pursue is... is just monumentally larger than what any Kickstarter game actually gets. Even the ones that get millions of dollars, they end up. Some of them end up, you know, having the same problems as as much smaller Kickstarters. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, funding is, even though I work in the the funding space, essentially, it's always like, like it's it's interesting. People just don't like to talk about money. Mm -hmm. 
it's a it's a really interesting sort of discussion. And I think this idea that it's like, yeah, it's twenty thousand dollars to make a game. Like, what? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not even twenty thousand dollars to run the Kickstarter. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Oh okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so the other thing too to note is that even though we got a number that's like pretty seems pretty high for a burn rate, I mean it's like 10, 12 people. So people in the industry, like other people, they're still doing AAA. They're like, how the fuck do you guys do that? Like, how do you how do you spend so little money? Yeah. And it's like, dude, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Tomo and I don't like Tomo doesn't make any money. I I get you know me and Dave are the other two co-founders. We get paid you know very little. Um, and, and, you know, barely enough to get by type of yeah. thing. My wife is awesome and supports me. <laughs> and, like, that's it. Yeah. That's how it goes. It's like hashtag indie dev life. Like. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, cool. So uh, this is going to be our last topic for the panel, and I, would, I definitely want to make sure that we have time for Q&A because I think there's a lot of really interesting things that are being said. Um, but... This is a topic that I hear being discussed a lot, and so I think having the four of you speak to it I think is really uh, important, and this is uh, burnout, and I wanna make sure that's the same thing, yeah. Burnout and fighting crunch. Um, so burnout is inevitable. You can, you can set up your schedules and say like, nope, this is how many hours I'm gonna work and I'm not gonna do burnout, and like burnout happens. It's, it's very normal. Um, so one, I'm interested to hear how you deal with burnout, um, I'm also interested to hear, do you anticipate burnout? Um, you know, is that like communicating with your team regularly? Like, I hate to use the term self-care because I think it's overused, but like sort of anticipating what your needs are as an individual and also anticipating what your team's needs are. Um, and how do you maintain a positive mental attitude in the face of burnout? And anybody can jump in there. Looks like Tavi's got Maybe the mic. We can start. Okay, why not? <laughs> <laughs> That's how we're doing this. Um, so, <laughs> before this panel started, we were kind of like turning to each other, like, like how dark do we want to go? <laughs> 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 and I think I'm going to go a little bit with it. But I would say um, I was already kind of in burnout when we ran the Kickstarter because our project had already been uh, in full swing for like a year or a year and a half at that point a year, something like that. And, um, and I think that it was already starting to sneak up on me. We were funded uh, in our case on the last day. So like that whole period is just like, like the stress and worrying about whether it's gonna come through or not. After it all ended, um, and I had a little bit of break from like the, the crunch of just running the campaign, I realized that this had been sneaking up on me for a long time. Um, and I actually, after having like a couple of deep talks with people, I actually started therapy for the first time, which I am still going to, and has been like incredibly helpful for just my journey and um, even just for making the game. Uh, one of the things that I realized was that like a lot of my identity was going into this project. Like it was feeling extremely personal, even though it's a team project, because it was our first game and because it you know like I did all the writing on it and that sort of thing, and. Um, being able to talk to somebody about like separating that stuff and stepping mm. back from it, talking about imposter syndrome, talking about um, the effects of burnout has been helpful for me to like start to recover from it. Mm -hmm. But I would say that that's like ongoing. I think what keeps me personally mentally stable <laughs> is like that um, being indie, the thing that I do love about it is that I can jump between different mediums mm. or I have to every other day. And I actually, you know, that's the part of the, the whole experience that I really love, because it's like, oh, maybe I got tired of designing stuff. I'm like, I can't think about designing anymore. I literally just, like, just do artwork for maybe the next week. Mm -hmm. And when I'm doing artwork, like, I don't, I don't have anything going on in here. I'm like, I'm literally just, like, rendering or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. So that gives me the mental capacity to listen to, like, podcasts or, or movies or what, what have you. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, that's just, that's just having fun mm -hmm. to me. So that's, like... Yeah, and then going for walks, I think, is yeah. it's the other break. That's great. So, yeah. Awesome. Rich? So um, uh, 17 years in the game industry, the vast majority of those years are working for large, faceless corporations. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to say games isn't awesome no matter what, right? Like when I'm making games, I'm having fun. I know at the end of the day that game is going to go out into the world, and no matter where somebody's at, they might have a chance of having a smile you know, laughing, having fun. Um, 
But when you're doing it for somebody else, it's very different than when you're an indie. Um, when you're an indie, it's you, right? At the end of the day, you do well, it's you. You fuck up, it's you. Um, you make people happy, it's you. You make people sad, it's you, right? So we work really hard, and that's a, you know, like you said, that's a, that's a huge motivating factor for us. Um, and it gets us through a lot of dark times, but I think really the way that we deal with burnout is we, like Tomo was fond of saying, we lean into it. You know, when we start feeling burnout, we push it harder. And, and we, we give more of ourselves. We rely on each other. Um, I'm gonna cry right now because honestly, um, the people that I work with are, they're like family to me. And you know, I go out of my way to do everything I can to make them, to make sure they get through it, you know? To make sure that they know that they're doing great, that they know that their contributions are, you know, doing something fantastic. That, that we have a chance of making the best type of, the best of its class type of thing. And it's 100% us. Um, it's amazing to see people progress through these times. It's amazing to see the way that we bond with each other when we're in these times. I mean, we do a lot of drinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and it's, it's kind of a joke, but it's actually not. Um, it's not, and, and it's, a lot of people go, oh, when I get stressed or I get sad or upset, I start drinking. And, and, and really, it's not that with us. It's that we have a philosophy in our, in our studio where we basically just let people be themselves. We let people be adults. We don't get on their ass for stuff that doesn't matter, right? We're not like, ah, oh, you didn't show up at 10. You're an idiot or whatever. That doesn't matter. Like, that's the type of bullshit. You say that for big companies, right? Um, for us, we go, how, how are you going to work best? What do you want to do? Do you need to take a day? Take a day. You know what needs to get done, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, people, when, you know, especially if you have people working with you, and you're not just like kind of a, a single person out there or two people. Um, I think a big thing you do, can do as a boss to, to fight the burnout is just you let people do what they need to do, mm -hmm. right? You let, them, you let them come and go as they please, and you make sure that you build adequate time into your estimates for where you need to be when you need to be there to account for the fact that people got lives. You know, people are going to be people. Um, somebody comes in, they do like five hours of work, they might be doing more work than somebody who does 12, comes in and sits there for 12 hours. Um, but that's not a judgment on either of those people. Mm -hmm. It's what they need to do to get it done. And if you get off people's asses about dumb things, then they do the things they're supposed to, they're happy, they're gonna have a lot more HP, right? Um, <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, a lot of the times what, I've, what I'm doing is like, I'm doing two things. I'm working mm -hmm. on the game and doing a contract. Right. And a couple other people are too. So we're bringing in money to keep the, the studio alive, mm -hmm. and we're essentially tanking for everybody else. Right. And when it gets to be too much, we can kind of sense it, and then we just kind of ease the people off and you know, let, them, let them rest up a little bit and then cycle them back in as soon as possible. You mentioned, uh, Tabby, $20,000 worth of work into the actual Kickstarter, and I've heard from many people that you know, once you get the money, keeping the supporters happy or whatever is a full-time job. So i just like to hear from each of you guys kind of to what extent was the work of maintaining the Kickstarter community, you know, what was the labor involved in that, I guess? Okay. Um, well, just talking to the to running the campaign itself, the advice that I got from my mentors um, and that I found to be true was that a Kickstarter takes something between one and three months, maybe more, of, of prep. Mm -hmm. That might be f part or full-time work for one or two people at your studio. Um, and I mean, whether or not that's sort of like, you know, you're paying somebody to do it or you're doing it for free, it is labor, right? So that's just the preparation. Running the Kickstarter campaign takes usually a month, um, and that's a full-time job for one or two people as well. So when you're factoring in all of that, either lost income or actual income that you were paying somebody, what you're asking for in your campaign might not exceed that number. And if that's the case, you might find it to be not a good idea to run a campaign at that time. Um, or you might say, well, I'm gonna consider that, you know, a marketing budget essentially, and use Kickstarter as a way to grow your audience. And that for us was like sort of an acceptable risk or an acceptable way that we dealt mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then at that point, I mean, you know, they, the prevailing advice, and I won't say that I'm always super good at this, but it is to uh, update your backers, you know, like regularly, so as frequently as you can. Um, I would say like at least once a month. And if your project is, you know, going for a year um, or longer, then that's going to be like quite a few updates. And those mm -hmm. are going to take a little bit of time out of your out of your day or your week to put together media for them. Um, and just to like, you know, to update them on progress, to write the copy and all of that. So, so just keep in mind that somebody has to do that work. And it's not like you can sit down and write a backer update in half an hour. Like it takes usually a couple of days to put something together at least. So yeah, keep that in mind. Cool. Uh, maybe one or two more questions if anybody has any. I'm trust, trusting this guy with the mic. He knows what he's doing. So we had a Kickstarter that we thought we were going to deliver in 2015. And I think it's a little bit later than that, but we're not done yet. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I need to check the calendar. But um, so we have a lot of like personal anxiety over the idea that we like didn't meet that commitment. And I think some of our backers are happy and some of them aren't. But um, I don't know, um, do you guys feel like you have the same kind of anxiety over what people are expecting of you? And how do you try to manage that as far as just making sure that your supporters or backers or Patreon's supporters are happy? Constant uh, angst. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, so we, we finished our Kickstarter in 2014. Uh, and, you know, we're like a year or two late. <laughs> so um, the... Anxiety of of meeting their expectations is is pretty intense. And in terms of uh, your earlier question, like I feel like making those Kickstarter updates, um, it, you know, it takes it takes that's about as long as it takes us as well. Um, but it's almost like they're our original publisher. You know what I mean? <laughs> like yeah. like they're the man, and you got to deliver to them to and keep them happy. So it. As much as it's an indie where we're in control of what we're making, uh, the, the pressure to to deliver like on those like milestones or whatever, yeah, it's that's actually where all of my stress comes from. You know, just what they think because normally you kind of tell yourself like, oh, I just want to make this for myself or whatever. But like, but you did kind of make it for them, and they they come at you with the expectation that they kind of own your project, which you know, you know to some extent they do. So. Yeah, it's, that's, that is where our anxiety comes from as well. Cool. Um, uh, we were, we screwed up and put a date that we weren't supposed to put, which is way earlier. It was like three months after the Kickstarter finished. <laughs> so even though our Kickstarter was much later and we actually delivered already, we were very late. Um, kind of didn't care what people thought, actually. Uh, we just did what we thought was the right thing to do, which is we did the updates, like you're saying about every month, didn't take that much time. Um, we started doing Twitch streaming, which was awesome, actually, because anytime somebody got on our ass about something, we'd just go, hey, look, I, I, okay, I'm a Kickstarter backer, I'm a super backer, I, I don't know how many things I've backed so far, so I understand that things are gonna take a long time, right? What I wanna know as a backer is this, I wanna know that the game's not dead, that they're still working on it and that it still looks cool, right? So I said, what's the best way to make people feel like that's what's happening? And that's to show them that we're actually working. So we just live stream our development every Monday, Wednesday, Friday on Twitch TV slash Epic Tavern. And, um, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. We have a good time. Uh, we still get work done. We get a chance to really build and solidify a core community. And um, anytime somebody on Kickstarter comes to us and they go, hey, what, you guys are like not working on it, we're like, no, we actually are. We're on Twitch every day. I don't want to join Twitch. I can't help you. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. You're going to have to trust me at this point if you actually don't want to look. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. Uh, no, no stress, actually. Nice. You are, you are rare, my friend. Yeah.